X-Men 97 is a flop. It's still a flop. And folks, I'm sorry if you're enjoying this show. I'm sorry to report that news to you. I'm sorry to make you angry by saying that this show failed to deliver the viewership that Disney and Marvel needed. I hate telling it to you because it turns out I really enjoyed it. Hello folks, welcome back to the Pro Channel where we endeavor to explain entertainment, keep you ahead of the culture curve. Today we're doing just that with a season one, season four, season five, I don't know, it's X-Men 97, a rebooted franchise brought back from the 90s, and this uh, season that they have just put in the books, we're reviewing it, but first we're talking about the fact that yes, it's still a flop. Sorry haters, or lovers, or well, some combination of both. Before we dive into this, folks, consider clicking the like button, and let's get started. We're using real data, and again, we'll talk about the review in just a few, but folks, real data right here, because that's what we believe in. I want to show you this chart, 2024 share of Disney Plus original series viewership. Now, I'm going to explain why this series perhaps is so good, with a caveat, and yet has viewership so dismal. Let's take a look at this. What we see here is that in, in 2024, X-Men 97 Season 1 has 6.8% of the Disney Plus original series viewership. Now, we need to focus on that headline here. And as we do, we want to say thank you to Mac, at Now It's Known on Twitter, who does a phenomenal job collecting this data for us, a resource unlike any other. But this is only Disney Plus original series viewership. That means that excluded from this is, well, all of the Disney movies. Excluded from this, Bluey, which is acquired, and all the other acquired stuff, i.e. the Hulu stuff. Um, this is not the top 10, the top 20 of Disney Plus viewership. This is a very small subset within Disney. Just original series viewership. If it's a single entity, it's not on here. Series. Disney Plus Originals Not Acquired. So let's see how this, how everything is performing now. X-Men 97 at 6.8%. Now, some folks have said, well, that's that's not bad at all. You know, that's 6.8%. That's almost 7% of all of the Disney original series. Okay, well, you know, that's better than Star Wars The Bad Batch, but I want to draw your attention to something which is not uh, immediately obvious. Take a look at Mandalorian Season 1 at 2.6% and then Mandalorian Season 3 at 3.3%. You add those together, you're basically at 6%. Now, you assume, folks, that if you're at 6%, that in that other category, which is 33%, that Mandalorian Season 2 is sitting in there. And you assume that surely it's got at least 1% in it. And when you realize that, you realize that the Mandalorian reruns, right? There's nothing going on with the Mandalorian, but just the Mandalorian itself, just people going back to watch old episodes, is beating X-Men 97. That's Well, that's not good. Star Wars The Bad Batch, coming in close to X-Men 97, but I'm not sure that's considered a success at all. I mean, look at where Star Wars is right now. Echo at 11.8%, well, that was considered to be, um, you know, not a greatly viewed uh, series. It's got some viewership, but not great. 11.8, almost doubling X-Men 97 Season 1. But here's the real kicker, folks. This is the one you need to see. Percy Jackson and the Olympians, 23.3%. In other words, this is tripling what's going on with X-Men 97 and a bit more, but Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Now, folks, did we do video after video here on Percy Jackson and the Olympians? No. Have any of the other content creators that you watch on YouTube, have they done video after video on Percy Jackson and the Olympians? No. And why not? Well, because it's really not that big of a deal. Let me show you how not much of a big deal it is. If we go back to Variety out of January 18th, Nielsen streaming top 10. Percy Jackson, the Olympians debuts at number four, but only on the originals chart as young Sheldon climbs back to number one. There's something in here that's really important that we need to see. It says, following its December 19th premiere, Disney's Percy Jackson and the Olympians series officially cracked Nielsen top 10 streaming chart during the December 18th through 24th viewing window, landing at number four on the originals list with 572 million minutes viewed, okay? 572 minutes viewed. But this is not about Percy Jackson. This is about X-Men. We'll come right back to it. But take a look at this. First of all, what you need to see is that Percy Jackson and the Olympians debuted in December of last year. That means that 
debut is not even considered as part of that overall pie chart that we were just looking at. But 572 million minutes viewed. Now let's go back to the pie chart. We're going to show you why X-Men 97 is a flop. It's just, it, it is, it's a flop. And that's because if we look at Percy Jackson and Olympians season one at 23.3%, again, excluding the, the premiere of it, that, that's gone because that's part of the prior year. And this is only a pie chart covering 2024. So Percy Jackson Olympians, if we say that, uh, that it's tripling on average X-Men 97, okay, let's say that that's as kind as we can be to X-Men 97. You can look at the numbers right now and say, no, it's not, but pro is going to be as nice as we can to X-Men 97. That's the way we like to play it here. If we do that, and if we remember how many millions of minutes did uh, the premiere for Percy Jackson have? 572. If we then uh, take that by one third to figure out where X-Men 97 likely is, folks, where is X-Men 97? Well, it's not breaking 200 million minutes watched. It's not breaking 200 million minutes watched. Okay, so how does that compare then? Let's go to Nielsen today and let's see. Again, now remember, X-Men 97 isn't on this list from the week of April 8th through the 14th, which is where it should be appearing. It, it doesn't because it doesn't crack any of these, but we're going to figure out where it would land. Okay, so let's take a look. If we were at the overall top 10 for Nielsen, you can see that Fallout had over, well, almost 3 billion minutes. Bluey is at 1.3 billion minutes. Let's go down to the bottom. Here's where we get into the problem for Disney. Wish is a box office catastrophe, and it's pulling 642 million minutes. Bob's Burgers is not releasing new episodes right now. This is just sitting there on Hulu. Family Guy is not releasing new episodes right now. It's just sitting there. And what's happening? Well, they're, they're doing great. <laughs> they're doing fantastic. 734 million minutes, Bob's Burgers 679. Now, why does that matter? If we go to original, let's see where it would land. You can see that Star Trek Discovery at 257 million minutes watched on Paramount Plus is handily beating X-Men 97, enough so that X-Men 97 doesn't appear. But folks, I'm here to tell you, that that's because X-Men 97 is sub 200 million minutes watched, probably, or just barely cresting over, depending on the week that we look at. Is it cake? 308 million minutes. The Gentleman, Shogun, Parasite the Great. Listen, these are not most of these shows. These are not the kinds of things which are trending online that everybody is talking about. And my gosh, Star Trek Discovery beating you. That's not good at all. Now, why why do I say, though, that, uh, you know, with Bob's Burgers and, and Family Guy, this is so bad? Well, it's because they are simply episodes that people are watching. X-Men 97 is brand new, and it should be event-worthy television. People should be coming to this to watch it as it releases. They can't wait to see it. They love it. They want to see exactly how things play out. That isn't happening. Instead, just residual Bob Burgers episode and residual Family Guy episodes with Stewie and Peter and all that are handily beating X-Men 97. Now, we don't know the budget for X-Men 97. We need to say that. We do not know exactly how much they spent on this. So therefore, it's difficult to say whether or not anything on streaming is a flop. It's just difficult. It's also difficult because not only do we not know how much they spent, we have no idea how much these things make. We never do. And the reason that we don't know that is because when it goes to Disney Plus and it's made by Disney, one would assume the only way you can figure out whether or not it's a flop or not is to add up how much ad revenue did it bring in, how much? How many new subscribers did it bring in? How many of those subscribers are retained? And then we can keep going with all of the different things, right, that you can have to use to figure out whether or not a show is successful. And not only is that difficult for us to figure out, but that's difficult for Disney. It's difficult for almost any streamer who produces their own content to figure out the direct link between whether or not it was a financial success. But what I would suggest, folks, is that comparing it cartoon to cartoon. If random episodes of Family Guy and random episodes of Bob's Burgers, if Wish, if these cartoons are handily beating X-Men 97, if Wish, and folks, remember what Wish did at the box office. If Wish, which is the embarrassment of all embarrassments to Disney at the box office, if Wish is tripling X-Men 97, I don't know what, what you would have me say other than that 
From the standpoint of surely, the return on investment for audiences showing up and putting eyes on the show, it's got to be a flop. It's just got to be. Surely Disney didn't greenlight this thinking it'll never appear on Nielsen, not a single time. Now, maybe it will. Maybe in the next few weeks, the finale will get X-Men 97 onto at least one sub-chart of Nielsen. Maybe that will happen. And if it does, good for them. But I don't suspect that Disney brought this back with that anticipation. But folks, let's talk a little bit about the quality of the show, because the quality of the show and the viewership of the show are two distinctly different things. And there have been times when I've been very harsh with this show. I remain very harsh with this show in particular and very specific aspects. For example, I despise the idea that the X-Men now are essentially just trying to save mutant kind rather than all of humanity. That was, that was I think, the message from Stan Lee's X-Men for decades, is that they were superheroes seeking to save all of humanity and that Charles Xavier saw humanity and mutants as a, a combined force for good. And in this show, it feels to me like there are very, very few good humans involved in any of this. There are bad mutants, there are good mutants, but there are very few good humans. And that doesn't seem to me to be aligned with where the X-Men once were. I also take serious umbrage with comments from the creators as well as those who are interpreting what it means from the left where they, and I think this is established now in interviews, that they view humanity as sort of an allegory or representation of populism, and thereby the X-Men are attacking and defending the world from populism. And the reason that I take serious um, offense with that is because that's a political position, and that politicizes the X-Men. And there are nods to that. Melody Mack said she quit after the second episode. There are nods to that throughout. And if you're going to enjoy this series, then you have to move past recognizing that they are talking about um, the, pol the, the politics of today and putting half of, or perhaps the majority, of the United States, or perhaps Argentina, for example, into a box that is against the X-Men. Populism, national populism is the target here. It is the bad guy. And you can see that, by the way, in some of the signs. The signs have changed with the protesters in X-Men 97. Once upon a time, in the original cartoon, you would see these, uh, you know, mutants go home and all these kinds of signs. Now what you see is evolution is a lie, uh, mutants are sin, etc. It's taken, it's taken the verbiage of fundamentalism in our world today and transported it into the X-Men. And I, I don't think that's a good idea at all. In fact, I think blurring the lines between religious objections for today and making those be stand-ins for the bad guys who want to hunt down all mutants, I think that vilifies huge parts of society that probably don't deserve it. You know, I, I would suspect that, well, I'll leave that alone. Let's just keep moving. Enough said on that. Once we move past all of those objections that I have, and they're not insignificant in the least, what we find is a show that is flawed, but extremely good. Let me talk about the flaws first. This is a show that attempted to do far too much in 10 episodes. Far too much. For example, the Storm uh, B story, where she loses her powers and has to go on some sort of journey of realizing who she is with the scary owl creature and all of that. Uh, th pointless. We didn't have to do that. M maybe it's not utterly pointless. It's pretty close to pointless. It doesn't have any real significance on, on the ending. It has no real relevance to that. It feels like we needed to give Storm something to do. Um, also, putting Scott Summers in the situation of giving up his son and the revelation that he's been married to a clone and all of this is quickly moved on. They come back to it, to it in the end, and it's supposed to have this poignance, and it does because of how symbolic it is letting his child see his eyes. But all of that was rushed through. That that could have been an entire season arc, but it was rushed through in an episode or two because it had to, because of how much the show was attempting to do. There are also some other issues I have. For example, uh, the idea that Jean Grey suddenly bring and, and spoilers, folks, uh, Jean Grey suddenly uh, returns to the power of the Phoenix 
and defeats the bad guy. And then she stops and she's lost the Phoenix. And oh, but the bad guy's not defeated. And therefore, boom, we, we can have a fight where she's underpowered again. Those are sort of the, the do sex machina moments in the show that, that are a little bit campy and tropish. And, and they are what they are. Now, all of that said, all of that said, there are good things. Really, really good things. Nightcrawler, for example, I think was handled excellently. The death of Gambit, although I don't like that Gambit died, uh, the death of Gambit handled very well. The, the despair and the grief of Rogue handled very well. There are many things about this that do quite well. I enjoyed Jubilee, for example. I really enjoyed uh, her character and her growth over the season. And uh, there, were, there were mutants who were used sparingly but well. I also thought that we saw the very best representation of Charles Xavier's powers that we have ever seen in any moving format ever. I'm talking about any cartoon. I'm talking about any movie. I'm talking about anything. We saw the best representation of Charles Xavier's powers. I did not care in the least for the presentation of the outer space creatures that he was with, the civilization. Didn't care about that, not one bit. But once he returned to Earth, wow, 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 wow. Uh, Professor X is so needed. I also thought this show did a phenomenal job outside of the story about the child handling Cyclops. I also appreciated that it, it didn't become the Wolverine show, although we could have used some more Wolverine. It didn't become the Wolverine show. And so what I have to say is that, yes, there were episodes that were very uneven. Again, nothing to do with the storm uh, side quest mattered in the end whatsoever, that you could discard that and you could use that to build these other stories that were really important. And you could intertwine Storm with those really important stories. And that would have been, I think, a better way to go with this. There are episodes, though, that are phenomenally good. And I think that the last episode itself is really, really good. I don't like that we've moved to this place where the X-Men are essentially just fighting for the right of hum or the right for mutants to live, and humans are almost um, abstractly bad. I, I don't care for that at all. I, I want more nuance. And I don't care for the way that this show ended, where they all go to different timelines. But folks, I would be incorrect to tell you that I didn't have a really good time. And I would be incorrect to tell you that um, that this show you know, was anything less than superb in places. There are some really, really good things in here. Perhaps there's even something good in this idea of tolerance and that Charles Xavier is right about that. I'm not sure it's ever totally explicitly given to us, but I, I hope that it is. There were some really good things that Nightcrawler, at very specific places, uh, was authentic, I believe, to the faith that he has in the comics and in the stories. There were allusions to Magneto's past, his Jewish past, his distinctly Jewish past, and how that interacts with the way he sees the world. I wish that had been more forthright. But I'm here to tell you, the show is actually really, really good. And so you say, Pro, how can that be? How can the show be really, really good? And how can you have such significant qualms with it? And how can the viewership not be there? How can it be a flop if it's really, really good? Well, folks, I give this show somewhere between an 8.5 and a 9 out of 10. It's really good. A few adjustments, and it's it's darn near perfect, with a few adjustments. Big adjustments, remember, like I said, they're kind of these inserts that remind the audience, hey, here's what we're talking about in the real world, and if you remove those, you get to a very good show. I mean, just an awesome show, and the best thing Marvel has done in a very long time. So how is the viewership low? How is it a flop? Well, what has happened, ladies and gentlemen, I would posit to you, is that Marvel has created a negative pattern such that they have driven their fans and consumers away. And it is going to take shows like this over years, one, two, three, four years, to bring back the audiences. I would also posit to you, and this is something perhaps no one else is going to say, perhaps you'll hear it here first. And this will make sense to you. I would posit to you that what Disney Plus has been doing and what Disney has done has probably driven away 
the largest demographic that would be interested in X-Men 97, a revival of a cartoon from the 90s. The boys who were watching this, and girls, but probably majority boys, the boys who were watching this in the 90s are now of a certain age. And I have a feeling that Disney has driven them away far more than any other group out there from Disney+. Plus. So it makes sense that it would have a hard time finding that demographic once more. It's exclusive to Disney+. Plus. What does this mean? Well, I, I hope that it... I hope that the takeaways for Marvel here, for Kevin Feige, is that this is the right direction to go in so long as you get rid of these, these sort of brief inserts, these reminders of modern politics in a way that are inauthentic to the 90s. Get rid of this uh, messaging against national populism. That's a, that is a political movement that perhaps is... Perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps is being identified with by more than half the, the, the country and by major countries out there. And I think it's wrong to put your thumb on the scale in a cartoon about those sorts of things. Cartoons should take on philosophies. They should take on ethics. They should not take on political movements. And they definitely shouldn't grab them and pull them in. I think also more nuance is needed. But if Marvel will go in this direction, if they'll get rid of that stuff, if they will get rid of the last vestiges of wokeism out of these things. And if they will do this for years, then they can earn back the trust of consumers. And then the ratings could skyrocket. For now, X-Men 97 is a flop. I stand by waiting to see what the viewership for the finale is. It might be enough to bring back people. But it won't be a huge transcendent phenomenon through the culture. That's not going to happen. But a season two and a season three, that might be possible. That might be possible. I strongly disagree with Bo DeMaio on many things, the showrunner for this cartoon. I strongly disagree with Disney hiring someone who was running an OF account and is putting out content for children. But I also, in all fairness, despite the fact that I doubt it would be given back to me in the spirit of Charles Xavier, I have to say that Bodemayo seems to have hit a grand slam with this show. It will not, in all likelihood, be rewarded with the viewership that Marvel probably wanted and Disney was investing in. But they should not take that as a reason to quit. They should take that as a reason to continue to win back the fans. It's going to take time. And the quicker they drop the woke, the quicker they can stop being broke with audiences. Folks, that is the video for today. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to, I hope, having a conversation with Nick and uh, Coach from Echo Base Network. We're going to be debating at some point. We're, we're still working on the scheduling, but uh, do a debate on whether or not X-Men 97 is a flop. You might agree with them that it's not, but after this, we'll see what you think. This is your turn, by the way. Drop a comment down below. Tell us whether or not the show is a flop. And folks, like, share, subscribe, of course. Click it, stick it to the algorithms. It's the notification bell. There is so much Disney news coming that I can't keep up with it, and I mean that. You should be, you should be on the receiving end like Steven is, where I'm sending him thumbnail requests and having to update it constantly because of all the news breaking. We've got a Disney stock update that will blow your mind tonight, coming out at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Brand new video. Don't miss it. And of course, folks, we've got more pro shows on the way. Things are heating up. They are heating up as Hollywood, I believe, is wrangling with the fact that they have essentially lost the culture. They've lost it. And if they want to stay relevant, they've got to fix this fast. All right, folks, that's it for us for today. Hope you out there are having a great one. I recommend you watch X-Men 97. Again, 8.5 to 9. I'm going to give it a 9. 9 out of 10, my series uh, score for X-Men 97, with the caveat that I know that even if it is sparingly put in in a way that you can detect, I know based on what the writers have said, I know based on what the interpreters have said, that this is, uh, this is offensive. It's, it's going on the offense against a, probably the majority of Americans, but they keep it so subtle that you don't know it. And I think if they can fix that in the next season, please, please, I'm begging you, Disney Marvel, get out of politics. Get out of it. If they do that, 
then I think it'll be fantastic. Nine out of 10 is my score. Flop, though, still standing. Folks, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. Listen up, my brothers and sisters. You've been listening to Phil's and Zoe's with an agenda to destroy your brain cells for far too long. It's time to change your way of doing things. Oh, job. TPP is a place to be. Covering the news so honestly. It's a team that's cool and tried and true. Ahead of the culture group they're trying to keep you. Jonas and Pro, they run the show. And they dragged in the bearded culture casino. You got Valiant and Lord and Fourth of Line. Wonderful people. Yep, yeah, they're all right. They got weird bringing in. People like Flora, but made no mistake with Lorena Creole. Amelia and John, stuttering guitarist. Martin and Tani, and someone called CMS. Fat Steven makes a bunch of other graphics. Did I mention a partnership with Bending in the comics? That guy is a guy, and Doc Matt does the web stuff. There's probably some people I missed. I hope they're not uh, telling you the news that should be fun. With accurate info that's not been spun, you can figure it out as you will see. The TPP is the place to be. Yeah, oh, Wilton. Yeah, that was actually pretty good, or white. But I, I think you might have forgotten Vash. Well, he lost all his friends. But it was implied. <laughs> uh.